Welcome to the Longevity Week podcast hosted by the Longevity Forum. We'll be featuring podcasts all week on the theme sustainability in a decade of healthy aging, which you can listen to online at thelongevityforum.com. On this episode, Andrew J. Scott, co-founder of the Longevity Forum, will be chatting with world-renowned historian, Neal Ferguson. Now to you, Andrew. So uh, my great pleasure to have Neil Ferguson talking to us today as part of the Longevity Forum's uh, podcast series. Uh, Neil is uh, well known for multiple activities and affiliations and works, uh, but he's currently the Milbank Family Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institute at Stanford and the author of his most recent book, Doom, the Politics of Catastrophe. Neil, welcome. It's great to be with you, Andrew. Now, I know that, uh, you know, inspired by the Decameron, when the pandemic happened, you decamped the hills or the plains of Montana, I think. Uh, have you come back yet to California or are you still out in the wilds? Yes, we returned to California after we had got the grown-ups and the family vaccinated. Um, so the pandemic is over then? Well, it, it it is ending. I mean, the thing about pandemics is that they don't quite end, the, the disease tends to become an endemic unless you have the kind of disease that can be truly eradicated. And, and COVID is clearly not going to be eradicated. So we, we've we moved um, or are moving from the pandemic phase to the endemic phase. But my, my view was as soon as I heard how good the efficacy of the mRNA vaccines was, let's, let's get them. And as soon as we have got them and given it two weeks, we can go back and let our, our kids go back to their regular schools, which in the end, was the kind of the primary reason to return because Stanford itself did not reopen meaningfully. But we we were back in March because our son's school had successfully reopened, and it's interesting that small a smallish private school was able to get back to pretty normal service uh, even before then. I was impressed at how how the private schools around here were were back back to work even in the period before the end of 2020, while the public schools in California <laughs> remained closed. Um, and uh, and that was uh, one of many of the very unfortunate social consequences of, of the pandemic. So we'll talk about the intellectual content of the book Doom uh, in, in a moment. But, you know, obviously you're a professional historian, but then you're also, as you've just gone through, you know, you're, you're an individual with responsibilities. You, you've seen sort of the end of a Cold War, you saw a global financial crisis, and here you are as a historian living through a full-blown sort of pandemic. How, how, how did that feel, living through it as a historian? Well, history happens. It didn't end in 1989 and have grown accustomed to telling people who aren't that interested in history, well, you may not be interested in history, but history is interested in you. Things will happen that lie outside your own experience. And uh, that has, has been the case really throughout my adult life and my life as a writer. The fall of the Berlin Wall was something that happened when I was writing about uh, Eastern Europe. I had the unfortunate experience of, of writing a piece in the summer of 1989 with the proposed heading, the Berlin Wall is crumbling. Uh, the piece got spiked by the then editor of the Daily Mail. And so I never got to claim my my profit uh my <laughs> profit prize uh then i had a kind of similar experience with the uh the aftermath of 911 i moved to the us and started working there shortly after 911 partly because of 911 and i i wrote a bunch of books about empire in in which i argued that it was highly unlikely that the united states would make success of its quasi imperial efforts in afghanistan and iraq then after that i got interested in the possibility of a financial crisis was hanging around on Wall Street, seeing the kind of trouble brewing in 2006-07. So the ascent of money came out of that. I've, I've spent most of the last 20 years, really, or even 40 years, would be more honest, looking at history and the present and trying to use history to help me think about the present and plausible futures. And that's really what I do, which is different from what most academic historians do as you know, because most academic historians think you should never go anywhere near the present, much less plausible futures. Yeah, interesting. And of course, you know, thinking of that that record of the issues you were looking at, I note with some dread, perhaps even doom, uh, that the book for talks about uh, China and the US. But let's move on. So the 
the, the book, uh, you know, it's it, it's this extraordinary, broad and fascinating cover of sort of a general uh, approach to think about catastrophes, their origins and their impact, why they are hard to predict and why we're doing an even worse job of predicting them, the difficulties of responding. And of course, as the title wonderfully suggests, it's very much looking at some of the darker sides of history, although there was a streak of optimism at the end where I notice you think that an alien invasion isn't that likely. But you do say that you know, pandemics are like wars and financial crisis. They're the great interruptions of history. And I just wonder how you sort of felt about COVID, both in the book and subsequent, because of course the book was finished before um, the wide sweeping uh, progress of vaccines. The interruption that COVID has caused, do you think it's a pause? Do you think it's... Um, an acceleration or is it a sort of redirection of trends and things? Well, that's a great question, Andrew. Taking a step back, I wanted to write a book about disasters and indeed dystopias before COVID struck. I was plotting that kind of a book because ultimately a lot of history is one disaster after another. Historians are not known for the books they write about the periods of tranquility uh, we're drawn to wars. We're drawn to some extent also to, to plagues, and and that that makes us, I think, uh, perhaps slightly gloomier and doomier than than the average person. Certainly, looking back on the twentieth century, it's always struck me as hard to be a tremendous uh, optimist because so many things were going a lot better with the world in the 19th and early 20th century. Scientific progress was uh, was hurtling forward, uh, so was economic progress. To go to your issue, longevity was already uh, you know, getting a lot better. There were big advances in life expectancy in the industrial world. And then World War I and World War II happened, and you had these absolutely cataclysmic events uh, that, uh, to my mind, paid to any notion of sustained progress. It's been a bone of contention between me and Steve Pinker for many years. Uh, so COVID needs to be seen in the context of a historical process that whatever trends may be your friend will be punctuated by disasters and we'll call some of them man-made like wars and some of them natural like pandemics, but actually they aren't that different. And in some yeah. ways that is a false dichotomy. So. To answer your question, when the pandemic struck, it confirmed my sense that we were, as usual, worrying about the wrong problem. We were talking about climate change. We were literally talking about it at Davos as the pandemic was beginning. And, and pandemics just move way faster and kill more yeah. people than climate change. So it's been a, a, an interruption comparable with past pandemics, not as bad as HIV AIDS in terms of the death toll, not as bad as the big influenza pandemic 1918-19 in terms of the share of the world's population killed, but still up there with uh, some of the biggest disasters of, of modern times. What's interesting to my mind, I'll give you just two, two thoughts for the sake of brevity, is that as a public health calamity, COVID is not one of the top 10. It's currently running at something like 0.06% of the human uh, race that, that have died because of COVID. Even if you take the economists' much larger number for excess mortality, which I think they say is closer to 18 million, it's still a tenth uh, the size of 1918-19, just in terms of the population uh, share that it's killed. But if you look at the economic consequences of COVID, it is an absolutely massive disaster. Yeah. It looks much more like a world war when you look at, say, public debt data or central bank balance sheet data. The disruption economically has been much greater than the death toll would lead you to expect because the death toll is only a little bit bigger than the death toll of the 1957-58 influenza pandemic, and it had no economic consequences. That's point one. Point two which I think needs more attention than it generally gets, is that we have seen, sure, an acceleration, this is a commonplace, in our use of technology. Our uh, conversation right now is happening over one of the platforms that has grown enormously in importance because of the pandemic. And a lot of people's work-life balance has been probably permanently altered. Uh, my 
friend, I suspect you know him too, Nick Bloom at Stanford, thinks working from home is here to stay for a lot of people. All of that is true. But much more consequential to my mind is that COVID has revealed the true nature of the geopolitical landscape. There is a Cold War going on between the United States on one side, China on the other. And if that Cold War escalates, which I expect that it will, then that will be as disruptive of a technologically 21st century world as COVID has propelled us forward into the metaverse. So I think that's a bigger deal for me than working from home, Cold War II. Yeah. And, you know, in the book, you make the point that sort of the pandemic itself is not a distinct event. The pandemic itself, you know, narrowly conceived is, of course, something we focus on, but the consequences and the knock-on implications and the dominoes falling uh, make it have a, a much larger historical tale. And you just sort of pointed out some of them. So I guess, you know, it's interesting, you, you, you talk about just how difficult it is to prepare for these risks. And, you know, you, you, you you point out that distinction between risk and uncertainty, and you you point out the incentives are wrong. That governments never get rewarded for avoiding a crisis, but uh, so the, you know the dealing with it then becomes almost inevitable. You point out also the sort of the woeful governance, and you know then there's a sort of theme that that's the, the sort of the path of history that these things happen. Uh, some societies are better at anticipating, some societies are better at mitigating, but you're never going to fully deal with it so I guess I sort of had two thoughts about that the first was is it therefore optimal to deal with things ex post and you know what is extraordinary this time around is the speed at which the vaccine became available and was rolled out and you talk about sort of science as a religion um you know so is that is it optimal to deal with things ex post or what could we do better and I I guess I'm also going to throw in another point here which is you know, I remember long ago you telling me that, you know, one of the problems with economists is projecting straight lines, which I think is a fair point. Uh, and you talk about all these interruptions. But do you think we might be heading to a world where these interruptions, these crises, these doom moments are going to increase in frequency? Let me take that first question first. The The argument I try to make in the book is that a lot of effort went into pandemic preparedness plans that turned out to be useless when the pandemic struck. The US was ranked number one in 2019 for preparedness, the UK number two. And when a pandemic struck, they both did relatively worse than comparably developed countries. In the case of the United States, really a lot worse. And that was easy, and I think uh, not entirely unjustifiably, uh, blamed on on President Trump. But Trump's mistakes were not really the principal reason for 700,000 or whatever the current score of of US dead is. That There was a profound failure of the public health bureaucracy that would have happened even if Biden had got the job of president somehow a year earlier. And that's very clear from other books that are more focused on COVID. Remember, my book's really a general history of disaster with a COVID chapter or two tacked on. Uh, But Scott Gottlieb's new book uh, uh, basically says the Centers for Disease Control screwed it up. And actually, uh, there's a somewhat uh, similar story in Michael Lewis's book. Uh, It maps onto Dominic Cummings's critique of, of how the government he was in performed last year. If one reads his long, long Twitter thread or looks at his testimony, it kind of confirms the impression that there was a sort of systemic failure between the elected politicians, the civil servants, and the scientific experts, a systemic failure to understand what you had to do. And what you had to do was what the Taiwanese and the South Koreans did, which was to act really, really quickly. As soon as you heard there was a new coronavirus uh, and, and, and and as soon as you suspected the Chinese were lying about it, which the Taiwanese had every reason to think, you had to start ramping up tests for this thing. You had to have some kind of contact tracing system in place. You had to make sure that people who were suspected of infection were quarantined. They did all that. And as a result, the Taiwanese had 12 COVID deaths in the entirety of 2020. So I think the, the lesson of 2020 is that our public health bureaucracies were prepared for the wrong kind of uh, the wrong kind of disaster, and that's not good enough. It means that you've wasted an enormous amount of time on 
pseudo preparedness. My argument in the book is that it's it's more important to turn on a dime, to be really quick to react, than it is to have some very elaborate plan in place. Uh, Mind you, to be fair, the Taiwanese did have a plan, but they just executed it with great speed. And it was a plan that had learned the lessons of SARS, which I think most Western health bureaucracies totally failed to do. Second point, I think that a conventional view based partly on climate science is that we're going to get more disasters. And that is that 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 has some, I think, foundation. Uh, although there's a lot of somewhat deceptive and incorrect inference going on on that point. For example, it is not the case that hurricanes are going more growing more frequent uh, in the Atlantic. Actually, the opposite is true. So one has to be a little careful here. The kind of disasters that can really blindside us have nothing to do with climate. Think of a really big increase in volcanic activity. We haven't had a really big volcano go off in 200 years. The last one was Tambora in 1815. Everybody's forgotten what really lively volcanic volcanic activity can do. We still don't really think much about solar activity, whereas we really should, because we're actually much more vulnerable to uh, a sudden upsurge of solar activity as we're so much more dependent on electricity than we were in the past. So I think we've probably got to resist the narrative that, oh, there are just going to be more and more disasters uh, because of climate change. Actually, I think it's more accurate to say that disasters will continue to strike either randomly in the case of, say, war, or according to power law distributions in the case of earthquakes, pandemics, etc. And that that's just the human condition. That's just the way the world works. And you may see some linear trend, or you may see a cycle of history. People love looking for cycles of history. And there are some cyclical elements unquestionably in the way this planet works, the way our species works. But again and again, the lines and the cycles will be disrupted by these randomly or power law distributed disasters. And we're just really bad at thinking about that, even although we are so much more scientifically knowledgeable than previous generations. It looks like we still basically suck at dealing with these randomly or power law distributed disasters. Yeah. And, you know, you make a a strong case that it's just, it's really hard to foresee all these things. It's also hard to react, but there are things we can do at both sides of that margin to improve. But, uh, you know, you make a, a good case. This has been a fundamentally sort of reoccurring challenge in history uh, and different societies have coped with it differently. But I was thinking of the Toby Ald book, The Precipice, which sort of says that, you know, now, given the achievements that you've just mentioned, the humanities um, uh, achieved over time, we now have the capacity to really mess things up big time. So the risks are much greater. And they sort of point towards the need for some kind of risk committee for global uh, issues. But given this fundamental weakness in society and humanity to deal with these extreme events, um, we've either got to get better seeing them beforehand or reacting quickly. So I just wondered if you felt that even if the events weren't getting more frequent, humanity's capacity to obliterate itself with the world was increasing which means that this doom challenge is even greater. That is certainly right. And I, I like Toby Ord's book because it put all of that in one succinct place. We are still susceptible to the old familiar forms of disaster, plagues, uh, earthquakes, volcanoes, and, and the like, uh, not to mention war. But we now have ways of, of destroying ourselves that didn't exist before. We, we can conceivably wage a war that would be enormously destructive if nuclear weapons were used. Uh, We've created new forms of vulnerability uh, precisely because we've become more networked, both in terms of travel and in terms of communications. That was a theme of my last book, The Square and the Tower. So he's quite right about that. And, And that's the thing that I think we need to be concerned about. It's not frequency, it's actually the range of new forms of disaster that that really we need to worry about. And the challenge, I think, is that if you kind of list them all, and I try to do that towards the end of the book, it's quite a long list. Uh, That's quite a lot of things you have to keep an eye on. And yet, when we try to think and act globally, 
by creating institutions precisely for that purpose. It's not like we don't have global risk agencies. What the hell is the World Health Organization? What are these COP conferences about? Uh, what was the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change supposed to do? I mean, we actually do quite a lot of this kind of thing, but we're very, very susceptible to myopia. And I think the, the classic uh, form of this is that we, we spend much, much more time thinking about the climate problem than about the other ones. Uh, and in fact, nuclear proliferation is, seems highly likely uh, to accelerate in the next uh, 10 or 20 years. I can anticipate nuclear arms races in the Middle East and in uh, East Asia. And that, that should probably worry us just as much as uh, climate change. I'm not quite as sanguine as Bjorn Lomborg, but I think he gets quite a lot right when he says that a, uh, this is a relatively slow moving form of threat, certainly compared with the pandemic. And B, a lot of what the radical environmentalists propose is self defeating because it's economically going to uh, impact us in ways that will reduce our resources for mitigation. So I, I do worry that we, we, are we are inclined to be somewhat tunnel visioned in focusing on. The, the, the form of disaster that we find most interesting and, and ignoring the others. And that, that's essentially what we were doing at the beginning of 2020. Uh, and I think we're going to revert, revert quite quickly to doing that e as, as soon as this year. So that's right. And I'm conscious of time, but I do want to bring in aging and longevity, because of course this is the longevity forum. And it's interesting you were talking through about all the events that, that history is interested in you. And of course, as lives get longer, you will see more twists and turns. Uh, it also encourages, it should encourage a longer term horizon. I think it's in um, the leopard where the count says, I'm only care for those I will meet. And if you're living longer, you'll care for more. But I wondered, you know, you talk about grey rhinos in the book, these big, obvious problems that are lumbering towards us. Uh, we can see, but we tend to sort of just not take, take account of. An ageing society seems to be one of those. So, you know, how does the world wake up to that? Or do you think it's just going to be a very slow moving challenge that we're just going to wake up to too late? One of the possibilities that occurred to me at the beginning of the pandemic was that perhaps uh, nature had decided to address the problem of uh, a greying or aging planet uh, with a carefully designed disease that picked off the elderly. Uh, from the kind of perspective of 100 years ago when social Darwinism was still in vogue, COVID was a pretty elegantly designed disease that, that discriminated against the elderly and, and, and people with pre-existing uh, conditions. Most pandemics don't do that. Most pandemics go after the very young as well as the very old, and some pandemics go after people in the prime of life. But, but COVID was sort of ageist, and of course it actually just hasn't killed that larger share of the world's population, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and, and therefore, it, it's really barely a dent in the kind of demographic trends, far more important, in, in fact, than COVID is the very low birth rate that we see yeah. in China, or for that matter, in, in other Asian countries like South Korea. We, we can imagine a scenario in which the Chinese population could fall by half between now and the end of the century, 50%. That's the, the sort of worst case scenario. Uh, of the UN population uh, projections. So I think despite COVID, the planet is still, is gonna continue agreeing uh, between relatively low birth rates and relatively resilient uh, longevity. I say relatively, because there are all kinds of adverse uh, trends of which the deaths of despair in the United States is one of the most interesting. My sense is that, that this, kind of a world, Japan is the kind of ex extreme case of, of a, a really strikingly elderly society, has the potential to be stable. Japan is a, a surprisingly stable place, considering mm -hmm. uh, what the economics looked like back in 1989-90. And, and maybe when I visit Germany, I think this is a country on its way to being Japan, Maybe that's where Europe goes. But I think the confounding variable is migration. And the fact that Japan has essentially aged with minimal migration, while Europe is going to age with a lot more, especially if 
if climate change drives a really large number of people northwards and, and, and westwards towards Europe, then I think that is going to be the great problem. My, my final observation, given that time is running out on us, is that for about 20 years, I've said that politics would cease to be about class, about distribution between uh, income or, or wealth uh, segments of the population, and would become about generational conflict. I mean, that has become more and more apparent. And I first wrote it 20 years ago in a book called The Cash Nexus. And I, th- when you get a, a kind of overlay of, uh, of, of ethnic difference on top of generational division, you get potentially a very, very volatile kind of politics. And that's where I think we probably, we are probably heading. Yeah, I, well, I hope you're wrong. I mean, I, I I think the whole generation stuff is very dangerous and easy to misconceive, but I, that's a conversation for another time. I mean, clearly COVID has shown as a viral form of ageing just how vulnerable we are with so many older people that you cannot have a healthy economy without a healthy population. So I'm rather hoping that a healthy longevity be one of the key things to emerge from this as a public priority. But thank you, Neil. Thank you for the book. Thank you for the conversation. Uh, and thank you for explaining doom and its implications. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. And I'm I'm striving for healthy longevity, but I come from the part of the UK which has the worst numbers on longevity still, namely Glasgow and its environs. So the odds are against me, I'm afraid. Well, well, I see what we can do. I, I mean, you mentioned deaths of despair. Given the resources we've put into trying to save lives through COVID, let's hope we can do the same to tackle those inequalities. Thank you, Neil. I'm into that. Thanks, Andrew. This broadcast has been brought to you by the Longevity Forum as part of Longevity Week 2021. We are very grateful to our sponsors, Juvenescence and Burnbrae. For more podcasts, visit our website, thelongevityforum.com, or follow us on Twitter, longevity underscore forum.